Yeah, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this, the 20th meeting of 2015 of the Public Petitions Committee. Can I ask everyone present to please turn off their mobile phones and any other electronic equipment as it interferes with the sound system? Uh, apologies have been received this morning from David Torrance and Jackson Carlaw, and for that reason, uh, to replace David Torrance, Jim Eady is in attendance. Welcome to the committee, Jim. Um, Angus MacDonald is moving amendments to the Education and, uh, the Education and Culture Committee, but he'll join us uh, if that we get to that point in the meeting. So our first agenda item this morning is uh, um, to seek agreement on taking agenda item three on witness expenses in private. Does the committee agree? Agreed. That brings us then to agenda item two, which is uh, consideration of PE1463 by Lorraine Cleaver of effective thyroid and adrenal testing, diagnosis and treatment. Uh, we were taking evidence from the petitioner, but I'm also uh, delighted to say that we're joined by Elaine Smith, MSP, who has an interest in this petition. Um, but we're going to hear first from uh, Lorraine Cleaver. Um, I'll open the meeting up to you to speak to us for two or three minutes and then we'll take questions if that's okay. So over okay. to you. Thank you, convener, and thanks to the committee for letting me speak today. Um, as you know, it's been almost a year since I lodged this petition with two co-petitioners who have now left. Um, I'm a bit concerned that the petitions came to a kind of impasse because at the last meeting it was agreed that SIGN would look into doing a piece of work for guidelines into this illness. Um, as I noted in my submission to you last week, I had a meeting with SIGN because I do have concerns about guidelines. I have concerns that guidelines already are fraught with problems for many, many illnesses because it's not personalised medicine. Um, it somewhat puts you in a box. And I think I was right to have those concerns because it was also in the press a few months back that some of the people working on the guidelines committee do have financial conflicts of interest or certainly financial interests. Um, so anyway, we had quite a, an intensive meeting and I think the upshot of that was that guidelines will, look, will do a sweep of all the current evidence that there is, that exists. And although there is really good evidence backing my petition, the volume that is there would be drowned out by the, the current older evidence. And it could end up that we would have the same old, same old at the end of a five year project. So it was agreed that we, we would work hopefully with the Royal College of GPs in Scotland and produce a kind of best practice document. And essentially that would only be doing what should already be done. It's not actually going to achieve anything new that I asked for in the petition. It would simply be flagging up for GPs that if a patient comes to you with continued problems on thyroxin, do this, this, this and this. And, you know, the, these things are, already exist, but they're never been adhered to, they're never been noticed. So that piece of work would be really useful for 80% of the population with thyroid problems because they do go back to the doctor with odd, odd symptoms and the doctors aren't aware of what they should be doing next, checking their B12 levels, checking their iron cortisol, etc. However, it does absolutely nothing to address the people who have no ability to use level thyroxine, the one and only NHS prescribed medication. And that is, according to the Royal College of Physicians, nine, um, sorry, five to 10%. We actually think it's a lot higher. I, in my experience, it's vastly higher than that. So this piece of work that SIGN will conduct will never touch those people. And that was the entire reason that I came to the Petitions Committee. Quite apart from that, it doesn't address the fact that the medication that I need to stay alive is not available on the NHS. It's not licensed in this country. And that's a job for the MHRA. Now, I don't know if you recall that um, Alec Neal came here a few years back, a year and a half, two years ago, and gave evidence about that situation and acknowledged that it was the MHRA's job to look into licensing. But that if we got independence, um, maybe that situation would change. So, of course, it hasn't changed. But it does make me concerned that we have a Scottish NHS and yet we have no method for looking into licensing new drugs for our Scottish patients. And I think that I would urge the committee to have one more roundtable meeting to look again at the fresh evidence coming through 
that I've discussed um, for those 10 to 20 percent of people that don't recover and to look at the licensing situation because the European Parliament have closed down my petition there saying it's up to the MHRA and we're not we're not we're just not moving forward anyway um, yes I know why it's not being looked at because it's a natural product that I'm looking for and a natural product from nature can't be patented so there's not a great will to put a lot of money into doing research but as the late Dr Skinner said it there's something rather disingenuous that we have to prove that something that was used for 80 years and was cast aside and removed from the BNF in favour of a new synthetic that didn't have to prove its metal we're proving a negative and that's a ridiculous position to be in we're costing the NHS billions. The drugs we're looking for are cheap. There's, there's no reason why Scotland can't conduct a trial comparing the old natural thyroid with the relatively new level thyroxine that's given all these problems. So to sum up, yes, I would urge the committee not to close the petition because in three years, ultimately, all we have achieved is a piece of work with sign that hasn't begun, may take two years, and will only address patients that I was never campaigning on behalf of. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing us up to speed with, with how things are. I'll come to Elaine first because you've had a long standing interest in this. Elaine, do you want to add some comments before I open up to the committee to ask questions? Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Um, Lorraine, as she says, has been working on this now for over three years. The committee's been looking at it. There was a listening exercise as well that the government were conducting. I don't think we've had anything back from that yet. Um, Basically, the bottom line to me is there's a lot of patients in Scotland who are not getting the right treatment. Some of them don't even know they're not. There's patients who should be on even level thyroxine who are, called, who are deemed as being borderline, for example. And I know many of them, and they're not even getting the medicine. The, the whole situation around thyroid medication is, frankly, a bit of a mess, and I think it needs much, much more work done on it. More research needs to be done to show that this is what's happening. Um, and I guess the bottom line is I wouldn't be sitting here talking to the committee if I hadn't been able, even though I was very, very ill, I was able to push my case with my GP to get to a consultant, to get to the right consultant who was willing to try me out on T3 and basically brought me back to life. I've said that to the committee before and that's the bottom line. And I think it's a shame that there are so many other people out there who are not getting that opportunity. A, their GPs maybe not referring them, they're not getting to the right consultant. So the committee a wee while back had a number of stories that we put together in a hurry. Um, I think there was about 50 stories, which if you read them will tell you, you know, we'll, we'll basically back up what I'm saying here and we'll tell you the situation that people find themselves in. It's also predominantly an issue for women, although not exclusively, so it is, it's a gender issue as well. I think there's a lot that could be done in NHS Scotland. Um, personally, I would like to see the natural desiccated thyroid available and people not having to go to America and buy, it, buy their prescriptions. Um, I think I might do well on that. I'm personally not willing to go and do that. I prefer to just work with my consultant. And at the moment, she won't prescribe it because of the situation that she may find herself in. So I think that um, obviously the committee doesn't have a lot of time left. I would certainly support Lorraine's, uh, at Lorraine's request of you for another roundtable meeting if you have time to do that. Um, certainly a call for evidence could produce a lot more than the evidence that, that I gave you, the nearly 50 stories. I think if the committee called for evidence, you would get hundreds of stories. Um, and also, if you can't do that and you can't fit it in, then I don't think, for me, I would make a plea that you don't close the petition, that you put it in the legacy paper and you request that the next petitions committee look further into this to see how they could take it forward. Thank okay. you. Thanks very much, Elaine. Um, before I go to the uh, committee members, can I just ask one thing, just to get this absolutely clarified? Um, the best practice document, would that be purely for that 5 to 10 per cent that, that have been identified as the, the patients for whom the, the current treatment doesn't no. work? I, th I think, um, in essence, it was for the everyday situation that every GP finds, which is a patient's on levothyroxine, but they come back and they say, I don't feel this is working, I don't feel great, I've still got all these symptoms. So 
Where does this 5 to 10% come from? Well, it's quoted in the Royal College of Physicians documents, but other people say 16%. Thyroid UK's survey for the Scottish Government says higher. So it's for everybody with continued symptoms that's going back to the GP. Within that figure of people with symptoms, there will be a percentage that just cannot tolerate the one NHS drug, and yet there is no provision for those people. It's acknowledged that there's a percentage that can't produce, you know, convert it in their body, but there's absolutely no provision for what to do with them, so they're all getting stuck on antidepressants. So this document would be useful, because I think GPs try very hard with, with us heart sink patients, but ultimately they don't have a document to refer to, um, but it still won't be far-reaching enough because it won't offer them the medication that you know um, many of us use, T3 or natural thyroid, which brought me back from the dead. Um, I forgot to say when I was speaking, convener, I hope you don't mind, that um, I know that you were notified by the coroner about uh, thyroid suicide last year, and it wasn't put on the website, but I'm sure it's lodged within the documents. I've received probably about 40 similar letters from people's family who have committed suicide because of the appalling way this illness is treated. Um, and, when, and I just want to take up with, with um, Elaine's suggestion that if you could call for evidence, we, we, we have a shocking amount to back this claim. Okay. Uh, just to clarify on that issue, because it related to a specific set of circumstances involving an individual, uh, while committee members might find it useful to have it circulated just for fullness of information, it could never be put on our website. It it's, it's wouldn't be, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's, I hope that helps to clarify that yeah. situation. Okay. Um, the colleagues have other questions? Yeah. I'll come to Hanzala and then Jim. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Um, yes, um, I, th I think the fact that you say there's a, a listening uh, document yeah. being put together by the Scottish Government itself, is, is that what you said? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. The listening? The listening exercise. Yes, Who, who's actually carrying that the out? The Scottish Government, and that was last March or April, so they were they're probably running late coming back with the results of that, but what they did was they <coughs> requested a charity called Thyroid UK mm -hmm. conduct a survey of patients to get their viewpoints mm -hmm. on how they've been treated. And the results of that survey are in and they're back with the Scottish Government, so I, I don't know what the next move is, but the results of that were quite astonishing, really, at, at how long people are waiting for diagnosis and how, how ill they remain when they're on level thyroxin. I'm quite happy to continue the, the petition. I think it's important that we get all the information that we really need. And if we don't have time ourselves, we could pass it for, forward for the next committee to yep. look at. We'll, we'll have a discussion about what to do uh, yeah. at the end of the, the questions. Jim, I'll come to you first. Thank you, Convener. I just wanted to seek some clarification so that I've um, understood the issues correctly. Um, there is a, a medication available called T3, which 5 to 10 per cent of patients do not respond to, but who may benefit from the alternative. Is that you know? Five to ten percent allegedly don't respond to label thyroxin, the standard right. drug, and, okay. and they request either T3 or natural thyroid. Okay, so I'm just trying to understand what the issues are in terms of access to treatment, because clearly that's uh, yeah. something. That no, that's a very valid question. Yeah. Um, and therefore, if, if the manufacturer is saying, and the Scottish Government are saying, that there are no supply issues. What are the barriers to treatment? Well, I don't know where they get that from, because we've had three supply issues in the past three years okay. that have been so noted by the um, MHRA. And, you know, okay. Just the information that the members of the committee have received, if I've understood it correctly, states that um, the Scottish Government was not aware of any T3 supply issues in 2015, and the manufacturer, AMCO, has advised that they are working on an improvement to the manufacturing process. <coughs> and are committed to ensuring a good supply in future, which of course does suggest that there are issues still to be overcome. Yeah, so and can you just clarify that area for us? Yeah, please? sure, because they're the only manufacturer of this drug in the UK, um, which is why they can hold the NHS to ransom and charge over £100 for 28 tablets. So that issue was also brought up at a previous meeting here, and nothing's changed. You know, the NHS is paying over the odds for this medication, which is available for €2 Euros in Europe. So 
cost is an issue. GPs don't want to prescribe it for cost. GPs are not actually supposed to prescribe it. They're supposed to refer you to a consultant endocrinologist. And of course, with cost cutting, they don't want to. They, they make the opening gambit to an endocrinologist by email and are told immediately, no, no, their thyroid levels are fine. It must be something else. And they're not then forwarded to the endocrinologist. So they never really get the T3 that they need. And if they do get it, they never get enough. So <laughs> there's so many problems in every area. Just for completeness, can I just ask if you had any um, discussions with either the manufacturer or the MHRA about overcoming these issues? Yes, I have. Uh, repeatedly contacted the MHRA and Andy Farm Mercury, who I think have had three different names in three years, <coughs> and I'm just consistently told that because they are one company making it, they have to recalibrate all their machinery when they're doing a you know a manufacture run, and so they forecast what they'll need, and if that doesn't meet the need, then it's another several months before they're ready to recalibrate and make that batch again. So that is a danger of having one manufacturer in the country for one medication, which isn't just used for thyroid patients, it's used in cardiac patients um, and in heart failure. So it's a, quite a serious medication. Okay, thank you. Okay, Elaine, you wanted to make... Thanks, convener, just um, on the back of what Jim was asking, could I possibly ask Lorraine just to go through for us the difference between T4 and T3, the conversion issues, and also the problems with testing, uh, the lab testing of the results, and why, uh, perhaps Lorraine could tell us, um, why other countries have different ranges um, for their, their testing results that might actually result in a different prescription in this country? Thank you, Elaine. Yes. <laughs> I feel that when I'm sitting here speaking to you, you're looking for the gist of the problem. And in fact, there are problems with obtaining the medication. There are problems getting referred to a specialist. There are problems passing the test to be diagnosed hypothyroid, because in this country, we have set a reference range of 10. Unless you get to the magic figure of 10, you're not treated. In America, it's sometimes three, sometimes four, sometimes 2.5. Different cities have different reference ranges. So there's no parity across the board for whether you would be lucky enough to get diagnosed. So while you're waiting for that diagnosis, you can be you know, diagnosed depressed or fibromyalgia or some other inaccurate results. Sorry, what was the other question you asked me? It was just to explain the difference between T4 and T3. The five to 10% are actually people who do better on T3 or desiccated thyroid. It's about the T4 and the T3 yeah, and the difference. Because this medication levothyroxine that everyone is standard offered is T4 and it's synthetic and it's not an active hormone. Your body, your liver, your gut, peripheral tissue must convert it into T3 to be active. And there are deodinase defects, genetic defects, where people can't convert it. There are many other reasons why you wouldn't, because you might have pituitary issues or cortisol issues or iron deficiency, many reasons. And they're just never checked. When you repeatedly go back to a doctor and say, no, I don't feel well, it's never converting, but it will make your blood test look hunky-dory. It will make everything look fine. It will lower your TSH and it will make everything look fine to the untrained eye. And um, So we're never getting diagnosed, we're never getting sufficient treatment um, and we're not getting the correct medication that we need. When you have complete thyroid failure, your thyroid is no longer able to produce five things, T1, 2, 3, 4 and calcitonin. And in the NHS, we're giving people one thing, not five, and we're giving them a synthetic hormone that not everybody can convert. In fact, I think this is total medical negligence because we know for a fact what the thyroid produced when it was functioning and we give them one out of five things and tell them that that's sufficient and you know when they removed my thyroid gland they said we'll replace everything that it used to make well they didn't so you know there was a reason I became obese and bald and suicidal there's a reason for people taking their lives and it's not it's not depression it's not in their head it's not fibromyalgia it's simply a lack of thyroid hormone. Okay, John. Thank you, Convener, and welcome along again, <coughs> Lorraine. The, we have considered this as a committee, this issue as a committee for a couple of years now, and we thought we had resolved some of the issues, and clearly we haven't resolved the issue about supply T3 and the regularity of the supply T3 
we thought had been resolved. Clearly, what we're hearing this morning, it hasn't been resolved. You've indicated there's only one manufacturer of T3 in the UK. Could you tell us how many manufacturers of T3 there are in Europe? Not off the top of my head, John, but there are certainly more than five in mainland Europe. And I happen to know that patients are now booking their holidays to Turkey or elsewhere just to come across some T3 medication when it's either in short supply here or they've just refused yeah. it due to cost. The, and that is an issue. No, the, the drug is available, T3 is available in Europe and manufactured in Europe to European standards. Yes. Yet we seem to have a situation with the MHRA saying that we can only have one manufacturer in the UK supplying that drug and they're not prepared to go elsewhere to procure that drug. Yes, although when there was a quite a lengthy shortage last year, they were prepared to go to Europe because they had to supply the drug for these patients. So, you know, the loophole was, was opened when it had to be. But it's definitely not best practice for the NHS to be overpaying for to one manufacturer in the UK. But it also doesn't address my need for natural thyroid, and that ultimately was the reason that I wanted to petition all those years ago. Um, I don't want the next 20, 30 years of my life to be worried sick about being able to import the only medication that I can take. I have tried the NHS T3, the levothyroxine, and my own endocrinologist acknowledges that it's, I'm just not able to tolerate it at all. And he asked my GP, would she consider prescribing it? Because lots of his patients were recovering. And it was high time that Scotland conducted some trials into this because it previously had a fantastic record. And I think his words were, it's more than my job's worth to prescribe it. <laughs> That's my next question, was the natural desiccated thyroid. Who manufactures that? And is it manufactured in the UK, Europe? Or is it only manufactured in the States? It seems to be only the States, although some people are sourcing some that's made in Thailand. Right. But the States is where I source mine, and it's well controlled um, by the United States Pharmacopeia. And it's safe, but it's still not safe for me to be buying drugs online. I don't care what anyone says. Yeah. This is a ridiculous situation in 21st century NHS Scotland. And there's no manufacturer of natural desiccated thyroid in the UK? In, in the UK not or that Europe. I'm aware of, no. Right. The convener, clearly this, this is an issue about patient care and treatment. I, and clearly, I thought we had resolved it with the previous Cabinet Secretary coming along and giving us assurances in relation to sign guidelines, MHRC and others. Uh, but I'll make a suggestion at the end of the, um, the questions on how we take this forward. Well, to be honest with you, John, I think we've reached that point. I don't right. have any other questions. So, Hans Al has already... Sure, John. Yeah. Um, you seem to touch your previous statement on the issue around safety. Um, can I just point to the, the letter that the committee have received from an official within the Scottish Government, which says, in relation, and I quote, in relation to prescribing of desiccated thyroid hormone treatment, it is felt that there is insufficient evidence of benefit and lack of risk at present to support the prescribing of thyroid, thyroid extract and there are, there are alternatives which have a licence and safety data. But what you seem to be suggesting in terms of the availability of desiccated thyroid hormone treatment in the United States is that there probably would be quite a lot of data available to establish whether or not there was, um, you know, risk well, It depends. By, yeah, safety. I know what you're saying, but it, it's, I've just found out... It's wondering why the Scottish Government would say, or the official would, would say that there was a lack of safety lack data. Lack of evidence. So in fact, this there's actually quite... You'd be thinking that in North America, which is the biggest market for um, licensed medicines, that they would be built up over time uh, quite a lot of data on whether the, yeah. the medication works or has any, you know, what the safety profile of the medicine is and so on. There is plenty of data. There is over 100 years of data that it's safe and effective. Whether it's peer-reviewed, you know, um, medically... <coughs> collated data, I don't know. I actually don't believe it's even licensed in the States, although it's still manufactured there and it's still used commonly. Uh, there used to be the belief that it was um, a grandfather drug because it had existed for so long that it was just granted um, you know, a safe status um, and its continued use was no problem. I'm not even sure that it is licensed in the States, but it's regularly prescribed. 
Um, the FDA do have a safety profile on it, and it has fewer safety recalls than any levothyroxin or any liothyronine. Now, I see what the Scottish Government are saying is that you know, we've got a lack of a body of evidence backing it up against that. But when, when levothyroxine was in, introduced in the 60s and 70s, it wasn't trialled on females or it wasn't trialled on a large uh, amount of patients. It was simply introduced. And I think I've made quite a few comments over the past three years about that. I have continually asked the MHRA, NICE, the European Medicines Agencies, um, whoever I could think of, I've asked them, can I see this safety data for levothyroxine? And it doesn't exist. So it was introduced against a commonly, the only medication, which was natural thyroid. It was introduced, and now we're being asked to prove that the 70 years previously proved that they, that was a safe, you know, a safe period. Um, I don't know how you can prove a negative, but nobody's prepared to do the studies now because... Like I say, there's no money in a natural product. But it's a heck of a saving for the NHS. Sure. <clears throat> okay. This going to do, I, mean, I, I, I take it from what colleagues are saying that there's no desire to close this petition. I think the, the evidence we've heard this morning raises more questions that we need to pursue. Uh, Hanzala indicated uh, an area that we, not, we need to go back to. Uh, yeah, to the Scottish Government to ask questions. Join you the you know, I was going to suggest that we invite the new Cabinet Secretary for Health along to give evidence, particularly in light of the listening exercise that report that was supposed to have been produced. Uh, I think we could uh, ask the Cabinet Secretary to come along and, one, give us the feedback from that exercise, two, answer some of the questions that have been raised today, particularly the ongoing problem with the supply of T3 in the UK. I, but also look at the issue in terms of the natural alternatives that could be available. Because there is a clearly an issue, and I think Lorraine has highlighted, that we have got figures that anything up to 16% plus could benefit. Uh, but the reality is, for many patients, if they don't know, if they're not an Elaine Smith, who is a determined individual who goes forward and argues with their GP and argues to get referred to the right consultant, then we could have many people, particularly women, out there in society at the present moment still struggling to get the treatment they need uh, and the best treatment that takes them, gives them a, a quality of life that we'd all expect. So I think it would be useful to, uh, in my opinion, bring along the Cabinet Secretary because it has been, I think, two years since we've had the Cabinet Secretary here and to answer some of these questions before we start moving on to the possibility of doing our own uh, inquiry, which might be <coughs> slightly time barred because of the, the f upcoming elections. Well, I think that's a good suggestion. I should certainly invite the, the Cabinet Secretary just to see if she takes the same position uh, as her predecessor in relation to the, the, the comment that you outlined earlier about where we could be uh, in the future. Um, you know, we're in a, a different place when he wanted us to be, but that doesn't mean that, that yeah. things can't uh, be taken forward. Um, I don't always buy into this idea that the land of milk or honey would have arrived next year. <laughs> uh, but we're, uh, we're certainly able to test that theory if we get the, the Cabinet Secretary in front of us and she can answer uh, the questions whether she agrees with the, the previous uh, incumbent on that, Jim. Land of milk and honey. Uh, is, Jim, but I, we just take that for granted in the neck of the world. Um, could I just add one thing? Um, the, some of the committee members have changed since the, 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 very, the stories that were put together have been submitted to the committee. I just wonder if they could be recirculated to the committee because they give an overview of what people are suffering, what they're going through, and maybe even submitted to the Cabinet Secretary before she comes to give evidence. Because although they were put together in a hurry, um, I think they give a good, a good indication of across the country of what's happening to people. Yeah, I think they were already available to committee members, but we'll, we'll certainly uh, take up that situation <coughs> for those that, that might find that useful. Okay. So we'll take it forward on that basis, and thanks to Lorraine Thank Cleaver for, for coming again this morning. Thanks okay. much. Thanks for, I'll suspend for a couple of minutes till we change over.
Yeah, our next petitions are uh, from Margaret McCanns on St Margaret of Scotland Hospice. It's PE1105. Um, in order to discuss this petition, I welcome Gil Patterson, the constituency interested in the petition and someone who's pursued it uh, for the, the duration of the, the time that it's been considered by the committee. Uh, Gil, do you want to make some comments before yeah, we very quickly, deliberate? Uh, convener, thanks very much for uh, allowing me uh, back in. Um, I, I would like to thank the committee again for the decision they took the last time the petition was before you. I think the fact that uh, the two parties uh, will be sitting down uh, to discuss this matter vindicates the decision that uh, the committee made, reminding you that the government had recommended that this petition be closed. I asked that it shouldn't be. I gave some rationale why that should take place. The committee had its own views also. And uh, I think the fact that, um, that the committee took that decision, uh, the result that we've got now is because of that decision. I, I, I wonder and worry if, uh, what would have happened if the committee had closed the petition at that particular time but the fact that the words that were used at the, the, at the committee, uh, the expression from the committee itself, I think has resulted in, in, in this action. Now, we don't know what's going to happen from any discussions, but the fact that people are sitting down talking about, uh, about the matter is a very, very positive uh, step uh, indeed. And I know that... Uh, I, I'm, I've kind of lost track. I think I've attended uh, every single petition committee apart from one in Dumfries. I couldn't because I had business here. But the, the, what I would like to put in record that the hospice itself has attended every single meeting of this committee over since 2007, which is a tremendous uh, record. And I know that in, in, the, in the, the, um, the, the gallery, the public gallery just now, we've got Jean Ann Mitchell has taken over the petition. We've got Claire Murphy from the hospice itself, and we've got another great supporter, the former provost of Western Bartonshire Council, uh, Councillor Dennis Agnew. So they've put a lot of time, they've always been here uh, to, to lend support and, and, and uh, you know, hear what the petition committee's got to say. And I can tell you that I always, when, when I go out and speak to them, they're so grateful that the Petitions Committee itself, how it handles things, in particular this one, it's been going a long, long time. I think we all appreciate that, but it had to, to be quite frank, and we're not there yet, and I'm hoping that, it, that the Petitions Committee yet again decides not to close it. I think it would be premature. I think we might need to, you, you might need to consider it at some other point, but I think this would not be the right time. But thanks. Okay, cool. Um, I agree with you. Um, we can't know whether it's right to close this petition until we know what the outcome of the discussions that came about after the last time it was discussed at the Petitions Committee. Um, so I think we have to wait to see what the, the discussion actually brings. If we can get a report back from that, we can then consider a, a future meeting of the, the Petitions Committee, and then we can decide at that point if there's still uh, further discussions that we need to be party to. Um, I'll open up to colleagues to see if they, they agree with that. John? I, I agree that we keep the petition open. We must keep the petition open. And I think I've been on the committee for every meeting that this petition has been uh, discussed. Clearly, what we have now is the same position from the Scottish Government that they had previously when they, we last considered this, and that was to get a meeting between all parties, the Scottish Government, the hospice, and the health board. What I'm concerned about is the time delay that it's taken to actually get that meeting organised. Uh, and I would be keen, as well as keeping the petition open, if we write to the Scottish Government and impress upon them the urgency of trying to get a meeting organised as soon as possible, not to let this issue continue to drag on, because it has dragged on, in my view, for eight years. And I think we need to try and get some early uh, roundtable discussion with all parties concerned so we can then consider how we take the petition forward. OK. I'll be happy to write to the... Yeah. Cabinet Secretary, help uh, in that regard, uh, John. I uh, understand that I suggested a date, uh, and it's very, very early, uh, to be quite honest with you. So, but 
I, no, it wouldn't be for me to say to you not to write to the government. You've got to write, Gil, just to confirm that that's I think the case. that I was just about to suggest that, but yeah. just to give you a bit of comfort, there is a date scheduled, yeah. but it would be good if, if you yeah, just established that, that yeah. that's the case. I'd be yeah. delighted with that, yes. Hans yeah, uh, I, I recall that we actually requested uh, <coughs> the government to deal with this as a matter of urgency in one of the committees, I recall that we made that request so um, i don't know if we've actually got a response for that or not could, could we possibly check a record to see what we actually asked for a uh, prayer and see if we actually got a re reply for that or not well we can check that out but the, yeah. the important thing is we keep the petition open we ask for confirmation of the date of the meeting and then we await the outcome of that meeting before we can deliberate any further is that okay Okay, Gil, thanks very much. Any for thanks. For respond. Grateful again. We'll take it forward in that way. Thanks. Uh, our next petition this morning is PE1223 by Ron Beatty on school bus safety. And I welcome Stuart Stevenson, MSP, to the meeting. Uh, who, uh, Stuart has a constituency interest in the petition. Members have a note on the committee's previous consideration of the, peti the petition and submissions from the petitioner and Transport Scotland. We also have copies of the evaluation report of Glasgow City Council's pilot programme on school bus signage. Stuart, over to you to make some comments. Uh, I'm most obliged to uh, convene a thank you for the opportunity to uh, update in particular uh, some members who may not have been here uh, for the 10 years that uh, basically this issue has been before uh, various uh, forms of this committee. Um, the origins of this, of course, date to a road traffic accident involving Mr. Ron Beatty's uh, granddaughter, and I recognise Ron Beatty is with us in the public gallery once again. I, I think over the 10 years that he's been coming here, he's only missed two meetings at which this has been considered. Um, and if I say that represents a, a round trip of approaching 350 miles driving, you'll recognize the commitment that he has to improving safety for all uh, school uh, pupils in the vicinity of school buses, because that's the core of this. Can we uh, make things uh, safer in the vicinity of school buses? Uh, we've seen a fair amount of uh, activity, but perhaps I would suggest rather less action. The report that we've from uh, Glasgow, perhaps, I just draw a couple of things out to that. I know you will have read it, but uh, um, in particular, uh, that enhanced signage on school buses uh, appears to have made them more visible to people, uh, in particular flashing uh, lights, um, is especially in darkness. And uh, the question that's posed is to what extent did enhanced signage improve driver behaviour? And the study that uh, comes from Glasgow says most drivers uh, recognise that this told them to slow down, be more aware, cautious. Uh, and uh, the on-road test said that a, a number of drivers said they were more cautious, although I think it's fair to say that the report is not unambiguous in suggesting this is the way forward. What I would uh, perhaps suggest to the committee, and of course it is a matter entirely for yourselves, um, is that we, we seek ways with Transport Scotland of extending the work that's been done in Glasgow, as reported in this uh, report, but also in the changes in practices that there have been in Aberdeenshire to see if we can find what ways we can extend this across all four 32 local authorities, because although in Aberdeenshire we've had a number of accidents involving school pupils in the vicinity of buses, I know that it is not simply an Aberdeenshire problem, it's a problem for the whole of Scotland. And I think uh, the debate around this issue and the relentless campaign of Ron Beatty um, is, is something that we shouldn't allow to wither without a practical result. Convener. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Colleagues have comments on the petition, how we can take it forward? If indeed we can take it forward, Kenny? Oh, uh, I take on board what Stuart Stevenson says. I think getting a practical result is what we want. And obviously we do seem to have, to some extent, run out of road with the, 
Scottish Government who have been doing what they can, but I do think, given that we are running out of road ourselves, making sure that information is put to the UK where power rests on a variety of these uh, road traffic issues that are not uh, not minor but quite substantial. Uh, we're not looking for a huge or massive uh, change in many ways, but it can have significant benefits. So I certainly think getting in touch with the Department of Transport at UK level to say that uh, you know, there is an issue here, and uh, to some extent, put our shoulder to the wheel from what I assume Derek Mackay and uh, Transport Scotland have been doing. Happy with that. Sure. <coughs> I was just going to suggest we continue this petition. Uh, a note from the response from Transport Scotland on the 16th of November, where they claim just to have seen sight of the Glasgow report. And I think <coughs> Glasgow City Council have got to be commended on taking forward this piece of work because I think it. It shows what can be done if there is a determination to highlight an issue. But as well as writing to the Scottish Government and asking them to keep pressure on the uh, Department of Transport, could I suggest we write as a committee to the Department of Transport and ask them what their views on the Glasgow City Council report is so that we can then consider uh, whether or not they're going to prepare to take forward the action. Because we were promised as a committee five years ago uh, by the then Minister for the Department of Transport that they would transfer the powers to the Scottish Government to allow the Scottish Government to bring, in, uh, bring forward action on this issue. Clearly, the Department of Transport and the UK Government have failed to do that. So I think it, if, as this committee can write to uh, the Department of Transport and ask them, on the basis of the report from Glasgow City Council, are they prepared now either to transfer the powers to the Scottish Government or take the appropriate action that's necessary to try and alleviate any future road traffic accidents due to the failure of uh, school bus safety signage uh, and the roads in Britain today. Okay, happy to do that. And, uh, um, I'm a little hesitant in politicalising it. I think what we want to do is to ask the transport uh, Department, what exactly they're going to do in response to the Glasgow City Council's report to see w whether they're happy to move that forward across the, the country, and if so, what steps or what programs have they got in place to do that? Is it indicate whether they're intending to take this seriously or not? Yeah, I, I think like the question was suggested, Tanzal, I think the only difference uh, was that John wanted to test how far they were prepared to go in terms of the power. Um, I, it hasn't come up in the discussions on the, the Scotland Bill. There will be an ample opportunity uh, for that to have uh, taken place, but we can check it out. Yeah. Convener, the, the point I was raising was we did have the Minister for the Department of Transport at this committee <coughs> in 2010, and he gave an assurance at that time they didn't see any reason why the powers the, regarding the road signage could not be transferred to the Scottish Government and the, the officials from the Department of Transport and the Scottish Government Traffic, Transport Scotland could take place to look at transferring these powers. Yes, it might not have been included in the Scotland Bill convener, but there was an assurance at that time that it would happen. Uh, it's just a reminder to the Department of Transport that a previous minister did give that commitment <coughs> that they would look at transferring these powers. And if they're not prepared to transfer the powers, then clearly the Department of Transport have to look at the Glasgow City Council report and the petition in light of road safety in Britain today and bring forward some suggestions about how they wish to improve uh, school bus transport safety. Uh, and that once, as I said, my suggestion is write to them to find out whether or not they're prepared to take this forward. We can ask the question, it's not a problem. Yeah. What I was actually suggesting is that uh, rather than um, make the issue muddied by asking what the transport uh, minister wants to say about this or not. I would rather get on with the job, and the job is safety of our children. And I think we, I would rather get a commitment from the transport uh, department to tell us what they're doing to resolve the issue, to ensure the safety of our youngsters on the roads. The, and I, I, think, I, think, I think the suggestion is that we do that. Yes, it's just yes. that there's an additional question being asked yes. as well, and I don't think that's... I, I didn't want to confuse uh, the issue by... I, I'm not sure that we would. I'm sure that the clerks will be able to formulate the letter in a yeah. way that, that separates and, and creates a <coughs> distinction between each of the, the separate questions. So, Stuart. 
Um, just, just for clarity, and I've forgotten his second name, the minister, Mike Pennon, it's just suddenly come to me, I was the minister, um, who, who, whose contribution was particularly powerful because he was formerly a fireman before he was uh, uh, in an elected politician, and therefore he himself had, as a fireman, experience of road traffic accidents. That I think informed. It's quite a narrow issue, the question of power. It's purely in relation to being able to mandate <coughs> what signage there should be on buses. Um, it is perfectly permissible to put on uh, signage beyond the minimum that's mandated. But I think Mike Pennon made quite a powerful point as well in that he pointed to some examples of accidents, if I recall correctly, in Wales and in England. So there are benefits to other jurisdictions if the Department for Transport as part of the UK government were either to give us the power here or to respond and act themselves. And in this forum, I would not want to point either direction as long as it happens. That's all that matters, and all my concern, Mr Beattie, would wish to happen. Yep. I think the committee has agreed that we're prepared to ask that question. So we'll, we'll take it forward in, in that regard, and we'll see what the responses we get, Stuart, and I'm sure you'll uh, continue to keep an eye on it. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Our next petition is PE1408 by Andrea MacArthur on updating of pernicious anemia vitamin B12 deficiency understanding and treatment. Members have a note on the committee's previous consideration of the petition and an update from the Scottish Government and sub submissions from the petitioner. In her most recent response, the petitioner explains that she has now had sight of the guidelines and has provided some comments on the content of those guidelines. Pass over to Colleagues, can I? I, mean, I, I can understand she's still got some concerns, but it does seem to me that she did seem, in the main, uh, broadly satisfied with the direction of travel. And it might be that we require to allow these guidelines to bed down, and it would be more appropriate if there are further issues that follow on of this, that it's a fresh petition regarding a specific issue that the guidelines are unsatisfactory with, because it does seem to me that some of what she initially wanted has been satisfied. And I can understand that it's early in the day to be able to say whether the guidelines are working or not. But it also appears to me that if the guidelines are not particularly working, then that might actually be a new issue as opposed to <coughs> reviewing the initial issue which she petitioned. Given that the petitioner did provide more evidence, though, it might be worthwhile just yeah. passing that on to the Scottish Government and asking them to comment on, on that. It, it won't change the <coughs> guidelines, it won't make any difference, but we'll... We'll get an understanding of the, the government's views on, on her comments and we can take it uh, back to Petitions Committee uh, once we've seen those comments. But I take entirely what you're saying, Ken. We, we have to wait and see how these guidelines bed in. But the petitioner did have some comments on them, so it'll be worth seeing what the, the response of the government is to it. Members agreed? OK. Our next petition is PE1458 by Peter Cherby on the register of interests of members of Scotland's judiciary. Members have a note on the committee's previous consideration of the petition and submission from the petitioner. Over to the committee. We've heard from the past Lord President. And yeah. I think the new Lord President appointment, whoever yeah. he is likely to be, I don't think it's a she's in the shortlist, but uh, is likely to be within the next week, if not week, uh, so there's still time for them to appear before us. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so we'll write to the new Lord President, as we said we would do. Um, our next petition is PE1548 by Beth Morrison on national guidance on restraint and seclusion in schools. Again, members have notes from the clerks and submissions from the Scottish Government. Colleagues have had a chance to have a look at this. Well, we just continue over and and see what progress is made, and we can look again in the new year at this this petition. Is that okay. The next petition is PE one five five eight by John Tom on behalf of RNBCC Crayfish Committee, Ken D Catchment on American Signal Crayfish. Again, the members have a note from the, the committee's previous consideration of the petition 
And we've also received submissions on the petition from SNH and SEPA, the petitioner and Abigail Stancliffe Vaughan. I think we may have to go back to SEPA and SNH to, to get an update on where they stand on this. Um, again, there's the idea that we could ask SPICE to do a bit of work on that. Members think that would be useful. Can't do any harm, I suppose, if we can ask the question of them. Yep, so we'll do that. We'll just to get as, as full a picture of this as we can for you. Are, are there any, that's the only thing, we could ask a general question, but are there any specific questions that members think we need to pursue? I was going to suggest that we ask SEPA uh, or SNH to respond to the comments that have been made by Abigail Stancliffe Vaughan in relation to the, the trapping and other issues that have been raised in that submission. So they've got something tangible that they can actually they, they can respond to. Uh, because clearly this is an issue that uh, there seems to be di clearly divided opinions about how the best way to deal with or not to deal with American yeah. signal crayfish. Uh, so it would be useful to pin them down to or SNH and SEPA to respond to something tangible. And that I think the issues raised in, by Abigail Stancliffe Vaughan is something they can clearly look at. Okay. Members agree that we do that? Okay. Our next petition then is PE1569, uh, George McKenzie, on reintroduction of the Scottish Red Ensign. Um, the, again, members have a note on the committee's previous consideration of the petition. Um, do members have any suggestions themselves? Angus? Yeah, I think, um, convener, given that uh, we're still waiting on a response from... Um, the, petition, the petitioner to the minister's uh, letter, uh, which was clearly quite recent. Yeah. Um, I think we should uh, wait and see what the response is back from from the petitioner. Um, I thought the uh, the letter from from the minister was uh, was quite encouraging um, to the extent that I, I have sought advice on a legal position in relation to the flying of different ensigns within the same shipping register. Uh, our understanding is that this is not currently permitted under international maritime law. However, he does go on uh, to say that he would be pleased to pursue the issue with the UK government along with the petitioner. So I, I think it's only right that we hear from the petitioner before we take a further um, decision. That'll be after the new year then, I think, just before we hear. Yeah, there was a, a letter on the 27th of November sent by the petitioner. We might want to send that to the, 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 the yeah. minister again and get the minister's response, then yeah. we can consider it again in the new year. Yeah. Yeah. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah. Fine. John. Convener, just for clarification, <coughs> I'm looking at the letter from the Department for Transport, and the Department for Transport, it may be, it may be that I'm misreading this, but it seems to conflict with what the minister, Scottish Government minister said about uh, the flying of the red ensign because it basically it does go into any such request for colours other than those to constitute the red ensign should include an example and description. So it's really just to get clear guidance on what the Department for Transport is saying uh, in relation to any application uh, because I know that there are a number of ships that sail in Scottish waters fly under different colours uh, and it would be just useful to get clarification what the, uh, we, can, we as a committee can't ask uh, the Department for Transport to you know, grant those powers to fly the red ensign with salt iron in it. But it would be useful to find out whether or not the Scottish Government would prepare, be prepared to advise the petitioner how to take forward such an application if they were so minded. Okay. Um, not unhappy with, with, this, you know, with, with pursuing that, Anzala, do you? Yeah, um, I'm actually uh, very pleased with the minister's response. I think it's important that uh, another one that is, is going to try and make try <coughs> to assist the process in allowing people to, to fly the flag. I think that's, that's important for our, our shipping to be able to do that. A lot of other nationals do it. I don't see why we can't do it. And I would very much welcome the, the fact that they would be registered in Scotland as well, unlike many other ship, shipping companies that are registered all over the world and 
flag, different flags. So I, I think we continue this on, based on that and, and allow the minister to go that extra mile for us. Yeah, there seems to be agreement with a few questions there, so we'll take it forward uh, uh, to ask those questions. Our next petition then is PE1570 by Alan Lee on parental rights to child contact. Again, members have a note from the clerk and a number of submissions. The submissions include a response from the organisations we'd written to and a submission from Families Need Fathers in support of the petition. Um, there, there is other petitions that relate to this. It would be useful, I think, if we, uh, we got all of the information back on those other petitions as well so we can consider them together, or not necessarily in the one... Uh, bundle, but certainly consider them around the same time with the full uh, information available to you. So we defer this one until we've got more information in relation to those other petitions. Okay, we'll do that then. And our last petition this morning is PE1571 by John Beatty on food bank funding. Uh, members have a note on the committee's previous consideration of the petition and the submissions that we received from food banks, local authorities and the Scottish Government. Given that the Scottish Government um, is establishing the Social Justice Action Plan, it might be useful to wait to see the outcome of that and uh, look at the submissions we've received in the context of the plan that the Government has set out, because they'll be talking to the same organisations, so I don't think there's any point in duplicating the, the work. Is that OK? OK. So... With that, we're now going to private session as agreed earlier uh, so that we can discuss agenda item three.